Good day. This is Professor Will, CBMD PhD. Today, Sunday, June 28, 2020. It is 1:50:44 seconds a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this is a continuation of my current research. But before we get started, let's take a look at something I wrote in today's video diary. I would like to highlight some more goal planning. My bi-weekly expectations will be to ascertain as much information as I possibly can towards my linear power supply. It is imperative I reach my goal of attaining a purchase of a 3.5mm or 1 8 plug analog unidirectional headset for recording in my laboratory. I would like to demonstrate a presentation on Secret Project X in replicating an experiment in diagnostic tests using volt and amp meters, in addition to oscilloscope and frequency counts. I was able to create and design my own pulse generator and build it onto my own printed circuit board. Moreover, with experimentation and component replacing and testing, I managed to acquire the correct timing frequencies and wave signal. In the operation of my circuit, I was incredibly attentive and it was a delicate operation. The outcome and behavior of my circuit functioned harmoniously, even on the first attempt without conflict or resolution. Furthermore, it is in my perspective that my soldering skill or disposition came to me very natural with eloquence and intrinsic aptitude, allowing me to build a fabulous functional and congruent circuit, accomplishing astounding and technical performance. I would like to conclude this videography with a few comments, outlining the fact that Secret Project X is moving along quite rapidly with scientific quality and technical diligence. Well, I hope my audience enjoyed this presentation. Hope to see you again. Until next time, let's continue on with my corona research. EMS calls have dropped 26% nationwide in the U.S. since the start of the pandemic. Date June 26, 2020. Source University at Buffalo. Summary. Since early March and the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, 911 calls for emergency medical services have dropped by 26.1% compared to the past two years. But the study also found that EMS attended deaths have doubled, indicating that when EMS calls were made, they often involved a far more serious emergency. The public health implications of these findings are alarming. When people are making fewer 911 calls, but those calls are about far more severe emergencies, it means that people with urgent conditions are likely not getting the emergency care they need in a timely way. The result is increased morbidity and mortality resulting from conditions not directly related to exposure to SARS-CoV-2. This finding covered the six-week period that began on March 2nd, and this trend persisted through the end of May. The doubling of deaths and cardiac arrests during this relatively short period of time, from March through May, demonstrates that people who need emergency health care may be delaying care such that their lives are actually in jeopardy. Researchers point to two possible causes fear of contracting the virus of healthcare facilities, and the impulse to the burden healthcare facilities with non-COVID-19 issues. This may mean that future consideration needs to be given to how, with messages of risk associated with seeking medical care during a pandemic. At the same time that we are stressing how to stay safe from COVID-19, it may also be necessary to stress how important it is to continue to seek care for serious conditions unrelated to the coronavirus. Researchers added that the findings echo those of the studies in other countries, such as Italy, where there was an increase in heart attack fatalities during the height of the pandemic there. The fact that this trend persists even as the pandemic in some areas has started to lessen the severity shows that the fear of accessing health care has continued. One positive unsurprising finding was that the rate of 911 calls related to injuries declined for the obvious reason that during times when regions were shut down, there were fewer opportunities for driving and recreation-related injuries. The study also revealed significant issues related to the financial viability of EMS in this type of environment. The financial strain on EMS agencies will have long-term ramifications for maintaining this important safety net for our communities, especially those agencies whose revenue is based solely on patient transports. The study consisted of a comparative retrospective analysis of standardized patient care records that are submitted by more than 10,000 EMS agencies across 47 states and territories nearly in real time. Those data are submitted to National Emergency Medical Service Information System, Nemesis, database which stores EMS data nationwide. Estimating COVID-19 spread by looking at past trends of influenza-like illnesses. Date June 26, 2020. Source Montana State University. Summary. In order to better understand the spread of the novel coronavirus, new research examines trends in visits to outpatient clinics for influenza-like illnesses in March 2020 as compared to previous years. How many people in the U.S. have had COVID-19 using a database of information collected after the 
H1N1 outbreak. A Montana State University researcher is helping develop a better understanding of the spread of the novel coronavirus. The paper uses data from ILINet, a database created by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2010 to count patients who check into medical clinics with influenza-like illnesses, or ILI. That type of data collection for the purpose of identifying trends is known as syndromic surveillance. Influenza-like illnesses include any number of infections that carry symptoms similar to the seasonal flu, such as a fever, cough, and sore throat. Both influenza-like H1N1 and non-influenza diseases like COVID-19 fall into that group. Monitoring trends in ILI clinic visits could help better understand how quickly and extensively COVID-19 spread during the early days of its appearance in the U.S. Researchers examined a number of ILI visits reported each week over the last decade and compared those historical trends to such visits during March 2020. They identified a surge in March 2020 ILI visits that parallels regional increases in COVID-19 cases. By examining ILI data alongside the known regional prevalence of COVID-19, researchers and collaborators determined that there may have been many cases of the coronavirus disease that weren't initially identified as such. Researchers and colleagues estimate that as many as 87% of coronavirus cases were not diagnosed during early March, which could translate to around 8.7 million people based on the excess March ILI visits. The surge in ILI diminished quickly in the latter part of March, leading researchers to conclude that more cases of COVID-19 were being identified since fewer ILI reports were being logged in the database. Early on, there seems to have been a low case detection rate, but as time went on, that changed. By the last week in March, as more and more testing was going on, that case detection rate increased significantly. This is good news for scientists seeking to predict and prepare for future epidemics, said researchers. A baseline has been established through a decade of ILI data collection that allows for the early detection of anomalous surges of ILI that deviate from the annual average. With much of the research about COVID-19 happening as the pandemic unfolds, researchers said syndromic surveillance like this shows researchers in the medical community one piece of a larger story. When coupled with COVID-19 testing efforts of serological surveys, which seek to identify the proportion of a population with immunity to an illness, this type of data collection and analysis can illuminate a piece of the puzzle that helps outline our understanding of coronavirus as a whole while also offering insight for future potential epidemics. Researchers also said that syndromic surveillance using tools like ILINet could be applied in areas where widespread testing is too expensive. For communities that may not have the capacity for large-scale testing, this may be able to give them a picture of the movement of their epidemic in time and space. That way they can know when to implement actions like mask wearing and social distancing measures. The practice of collecting data ahead of a potential outbreak is an investment in future public health. Researchers said, this research into COVID-19 wouldn't have been possible without the creation of the database after H1N1. So continuing to expand the baseline data collected for other illnesses could be crucial in navigating future pandemics. All these different methods can be used to cross-validate each other. We know if our other methods don't work optimally, we have additional resources. Things like this can really help us be better prepared in the future. COVID-19 costs primary care billions. Declines in patient visits during pandemic projected to cost U.S. primary care practices $15 billion in revenue. Date June 25, 2020. Source, Harvard Medical School. Summary. On average, a full-time primary care physician in the U.S. will lose more than $65,000 in revenue in 2020. Overall, the U.S. primary care sector will lose nearly $15 billion. Losses stem from drastic reductions in office visits and fees for services during COVID-19 shutdowns from March to May. Losses threaten practice viability, reducing further an already insufficient number of primary care providers in the United States. Loss revenue adds up to a shortfall of $15 billion to primary care practices across the United States, according to the analysis to be published June 25th in Health Affairs. The researchers also caution that losses would balloon substantially if there is a second viral peak later in the year, or if the reimbursement rates were telehealth visits revert to pre-COVID levels. For many primary care practices, particularly those serving the most vulnerable populations, these losses could be catastrophic with many practices being forced to close. This could weaken the U.S. health system dramatically at a time when we need it to be at its strongest. Our prior work shows that primary care saves lives. The loss of primary care practices will translate to lives lost across the United States. To calculate the projected financial losses on operating expenses and revenues, 
The researchers simulated the impact of the pandemic on a variety of practices, analyzing both visit volume and visit type, among other variables. We then compared the anticipated revenues, expenses, and losses under several scenarios, including a second shelter-in-place order in November and December, as well as reverting back to significantly lower pre-pandemic levels of provider reimbursement for telemedicine visits. Once the most acute threat of COVID-19 subsides and the pandemic winds down, primary care in the United States will have to absorb the brunt of long-term COVID-19 care and management, testing and vaccination, researchers say. The primary care system must also be equipped to meet the piled-up needs of the population and return its attention to the major chronic medical conditions that collectively will determine the health of Americans for many years to come. The coronavirus pandemic highlights the fragility of the primary care system, noting that over half of primary care practices remain small and physician-owned, and these independent practices have limited access to capital and other support that could help them weather the pandemic. The researchers said their findings in the looming growth in primary care uses underscores the need for financial boost to the primary care system. The coronavirus pandemic is a pointed reminder of the importance of primary care to our society. Primary care is critical to limiting the spread of the virus and treating the comorbidities that can make COVID-19 so deadly and helping the people navigate the social and physiological challenges of social distancing and of living with the pandemic. While legislation proposing financial aid to hospitals has already been introduced in Congress, independent primary care practices have yet to receive significant financial help, the researchers said. Good day, this is Professor Will, CVMD PhD on infectious disease, molecular microbiology, and pathophysiology. We well, hope you enjoyed listening. Until next time, have a great day.